Hey folks, this is LJ, your opinionated host for the Opine Motel podcast. Hope you're well. Let's get into it. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for tuning in again. So I'm LJ, and I'm going to go through today a few of your questions from episode three, that is how to be assertive and confident in the workplace. So this is going to be a Q&A. You've been, again, very generous with your questions, so thank you very much. So another day in paradise, another day in the coronavirus. Today, believe it or not, folks, it is 33 degrees in London, uh, all for my good friends in stateside, 91 Fahrenheit. It's almost like I'm back home in Australia. Today, I'm going to go through the top eight of the questions that you sent over to me. I'm really glad that some of you are enjoying this format because it's a personal favorite of mine just having more interaction with uh, my audience. And you generously sent over over 40 questions to me uh, on this topic. So the eight that I've summarized, I've whittled down, gives you a soup song of all the questions that you sent over to me and hopefully gives you a flavor of some of the issues that you thought um, also needed addressing beyond the episode. So thank you for that. So let's get on and start answering some questions. So the first question comes from Ashley in Tampa, Florida. So thanks for listening, Ashley, and thank you very much for your question. So her question is, I fear and worry that I'll take it too far, becoming aggressive rather than assertive. Can this be helped? Let me start off by defining Uh, assertiveness and aggressiveness, again, just for everyone who hasn't uh, gone all the way through episode three. So assertiveness is that social skill, you know, the one that relies heavily on effective communication while simultaneously respecting the thoughts and wishes of others. Now, the key and the operative part is respecting the thoughts and wishes of others. That is something that's missing from aggression or aggression. sort of aggressive actions, which are forceful actions. These are intended to dominate or master, uh, quite hostile and very destructive behavior. So you're not really thinking of anyone else, but what is right for you. So you can see that there's quite a bit of difference between those two different states of mind. One is that you just want to convey what your thoughts, feelings, wishes, and actions that you want to put onto the situation. And the other one is you want to come in like a sledgehammer and dominate and kind of bulldoze your way through with whatever you wish to convey and be damned anyone else who has a differing opinion or needs to basically just listen to what you have to say. Keeping those two thoughts in mind, You mentioned that you fear and worry that you'll take it too far. I think Mike Tyson said it best, former heavyweight champion. He said that everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. So there are two situations in which these fears and worries can manifest. There are extrinsic forces, that is external, outside of yourself, and intrinsic, those internally that may be generating this kind of excessive anger that then releases itself during that situation. So let's deal with both of those separately. We've all had this happen. We've gone to a work colleague. We've got a nice, calm mindset. We've got a little script in our head of how it's going to play out. Then once reality hits is that our colleague is not as receptive to what we have to say uh, and is perhaps getting aggressive themselves or is being dismissive, which certainly can then spark and fuel the fires of that bubbling underneath the cauldron of anger. And so whatever plan we had at the beginning to be calm, to basically ex- display our values and what we want to get out of that situation then gets turned on its head and you're ready to rage against the machine. So first off, let's just get that out of the way. Let's not rage against the machine because that doesn't get you anywhere. All that does is put the backs up of whoever you're speaking to and then you basically get into a mudslinging match of who has the biggest stick to wield 
and who can hit the hardest verbally. I'm talking about not physically. Now, what we're what we need now is to use some of those tips and tricks. So let's summarize how extrinsically we can affect that situation. So firstly, before you even get into that situation, make a plan. It's important to write it down if you can't remember all of it and understand that that plan won't always stand up to the real playthrough in life. Therefore, have your mind ready and a mindset for this eventuality. Confident, clear and controlled. So confident in that no, you know your own value and know what you have to say has value. Clear, so clearly enunciate what you need to to that other party. And also be very controlled in how you do it. So be calm. Understand that you may need to modulate your delivery depending on what you're actually viewing in front of you, their body language, their tone, their change of mood, etc. Keeping calm when under attack and being challenged is a more difficult task, uh, and it's not always something that comes easy. You do have that initial fight or flight, you know, whether you're going to spin up and push back or whether you're going to spin down and, and move away. Be clear that they also have a point of view. So hear them out and then counter them if it's contrary to your own thoughts and understand that no one is right. You both just have a thought on how to proceed in the future. It comes down to actually what you actually want to get from the situation. You should know that you don't need to give in to yes, so you don't need to agree with them at the end of that conversation. And also understand that misinterpretation is a folly that we all fall into within conversations. And when it does occur, so that the other party doesn't understand what your request is or what you're asking, just calmly restate and recap for your audience, being clear that in what you're asking for, and also including a reason. There's also that point in that tips and tricks where I talked about if your comments get ignored or interrupted and what you can say. I kindly just point you back to that and just have a look through. So some of the statements would be like, just a second, I'd like to finish my thought. Or, excuse me, I think we got off track. What I was saying was that. And then you continue on with your sentence. It is making clear to your audience in an assertive but not an aggressive manner that you hadn't finished your thought and that at the end, certainly you can open it up to their rebuttals and then you can renegotiate from there. So the final point I'll leave you with regarding uh, the extrinsic issues that may drag your assertiveness towards aggressiveness is that timing is everything. Therefore, the person's receptiveness to your idea might actually not be down to anything more than they're just not ready to hear what you have to say at the moment. Not necessarily that they're against or that they disagree with your points and the contents that you're espousing at that time. So what I invite you to do at that point is to pause the conversation. Just say, look, I see that you're busy at the moment. This is important to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to circle back around to you when we've got a little bit more time to discuss. And then you can ask them, when would that be? So one of two things are going to happen. Either it's suddenly going to refocus their mind and they're going to listen more carefully to your ask, action or demand. Or they're going to say, yep, I, I am a little distracted at the moment. Why don't you come back to me You know, at Tuesday at three o'clock? And then you can go from there. So moving on to the second point, which is intrinsically, there might be something which that you are very quick to move from assertive to aggressive. This speaks more to a mindset that actually probably doesn't deal very well with criticism or negative feedback and may speak to certain anger issues. Now, that's a whole episode all by itself. I think most of the occasions, and forgive me if I'm making a leap here, the interpretation is it's mainly extrinsic issues that you're talking about in whether whether someone is being dismissive or interrupting you a lot is is causing you to then move to that point. But if you're just naturally drifting from assertive to being aggressive, 
as specified in the first definitions, you're moving into a mindset that is a further and different extreme, which then says that actually there's probably a little bit more going on than just problems with being assertive. Maybe there's a thought of some underlying anger issues. And again, those things can be explored and dealt with in time. So actually, the final point I'll leave you with is if you do fear and worry that you will take it too far, please understand that it might be that you're being a little bit overly sensitive to the spectrum of what people will interpret as aggressive. Again, people will not assume assertive people are aggressive unless they're very sensitive or don't understand the difference between you standing up for yourself or that you're going to impose your will on someone else and you're forcing them to do something. These are two different uh, situations. And I hope that's clear. I hope that's been some help, Ashley. And thanks for your question. The next question is from Todd in Jacksonville, North Carolina. So thanks, Todd, for your question. And he asks, how do I treat people that are passive aggressive in a constructive manner or in a assertive way so great question todd and just for me personally uh passive aggressiveness is a personal bugbear so i think right off the bat the first thing is to define what it is so in psychoanalysis it's usually relating to a personality that harbors aggressive emotions while behaving in a calm or detached manner so the behavior that follows from this is that Basically, these people don a mask of uh, amiability that conceals a kind of raw antagonism to one's competitors, one's friends, even one's family or loved ones. Now, the complexity of a person that displays these passive-aggressive tendencies, I think there's an entire episode there. However, let me give you a few kind of tricks or tips that can help you Todd, deal with someone that you might be dealing with right now. And uh, I think what, you know, further down the line, check in and I'm going to put an entire episode on how to deal with with passive aggressive personalities. So the first thing, Todd, is don't overreact. Try to reduce any kind of personalization uh, and misunderstanding that, that may occur. A common one in the workplace or even just with friends is... You ping them over an email and you don't hear a response for them for quite a while. So we've all probably experienced something uh, of this phenomenon in which that, yeah, okay, the email's out, still no response, and you're scratching your head thinking, why are they not responding? Well, if we take a step back, we just can start to think, okay, maybe they're not ignoring my suggestion or my email. Maybe they're just taking some time to decide about how to respond properly. Or maybe they were busy and they've just missed it and haven't responded in a certain amount of time. Certainly now within our digital world, we almost expect instant responses from when it hits our head, we communicate that out to the world because the digital transfer is instantaneous. We almost expect sometimes instantaneous responses to whatever thought that goes through our head. We're not used to waiting as long. And this may not be specifically a problem that you're having to deal with, but it does break down to the point of let's not personalize or theorize on exactly what might be in their head so we don't create some sort of misunderstanding. And when we avoid personalizing other people's kind of behaviors like this, we can certainly perceive their expressions kind of more objectively. Because we need to understand, look, people do things for them uh, more than us. They're not not always thinking about us and our situation and our thoughts and feelings whenever responding to anything that we throw out into the world. So let's just kind of widen our perspective and reduce maybe the possibility for misunderstanding. However, if we go to a point where, look, there's this person or this individual that you may or may not be dealing with right now, Todd, is clearly showing such patterns of kind of passive aggressiveness. Well, firstly, just keep your distance wherever possible. Just try and avoid them. 
it's life is short and some of these passive aggressive people yeah they may not fully understand or realize that this is a mode of aggression that they're using or it actually might be a conscious decision and these are the oxygen thieves that's what i call them people who essentially suck the oxygen out of the room and every time you deal with them you feel a little bit more drained after coming away from a, a situation so don't don't try and change them it's not going to work to to try and change them there are underlying issues in which that yes do need to be addressed but they they will never be addressed at that time with you and i say this with all due respect it's not that all of you can't go out and and subtly you know nudge them in a general direction but if the if it is a a very long held pattern with that person I'm always the muse where people think that they can suddenly become the psychologist, the therapist to guide them and change them in ways that, one, they may not truly have an understanding of the underlying issues, and two, look, you have a job to do, or maybe it's a friend, you're not there to necessarily coach and be that therapist for them to get them back on track. So just avoid them. Now, there are situations where whether it's your boss or a work colleague that you have to work with or even a friend, good friend, or a loved one. These are situations you can't avoid. Therefore, the key here is to not get sucked in. Don't fall for the trap. Avoid that tit for tat. There there is no need uh, and no good outcome that's going to come with that urge that will bubble up inside you to strike back overtly kind of arguing or use a pointed language and also perhaps maybe even becoming passive aggressive uh, yourself at that situation and the key is to stay calm and yeah i know what you're thinking yeah sure lj just stay calm but it's one of the things that certain passive aggressive individuals feed on is the fact that they're actually getting under your skin so by doing the opposite You are doing that nudge theory of essentially getting them to understand that the way to deal with you is not to keep replicating the same cycles because they're not getting a feedback loop. So in a way, you're asserting your calmness. I hope that makes sense. So Todd, I am going to do, uh, it's decided now, I will do a much deeper episode on this. So Fear not, uh, your question is going to be expanded into an episode. But the last tip I'll leave with you is to give that passive-aggressive person a chance to help solve some of the problems. Most of these individuals, they behave because they really don't believe that they have a voice. And so when appropriate, just bring them into the discussions or ask for their input, ask them for solutions, and see if they come up with constructive solutions on the other hand if you if you're hearing uh, mostly kind of complaints and criticisms don't agree to disagree just simply say that you'll keep what they said in mind and then get on with what you need to get done so again you're asserting your yourself in a constructive way without feeding and enabling their mindset to spin out and start being all negative on that situation So, Todd, I hope those couple of tips have helped and you've certainly inspired me to do a full episode on this because I think there is a lot to to unpack and deep dive on, on this particular subject. So thanks for your question. So the next question comes from Elin in Reykjavik in Iceland. I hope I pronounce your your name right, Elin. Uh, it's I, I just have to say, as, as an aside, I'm always amazed at how far this modern technology of podcasting and that can can spread around the world. So, but thank you very much for your question, Ellen. So, your question was: Having never been assertive, how do I trust that I haven't misjudged the situation and the person? What if I'm wrong, which would make me feel worse and less likely to try again? So, thank you, Ellen. Let me see if I can tackle this. First and foremost, there is no way of knowing. And I know that it's not meant to be a glib answer or a throwaway answer. There is no way. And 
I know this because as a psychologist, the only way that I can know what's in your head or in someone else's head or when I'm having a conversation is to ask questions. Now, don't get me wrong, we we can get a good sense of the situation with using our past experiences, our past understandings, our running through past conversations that we've had, and we, we model and pattern recognition that in our head and our subconscious. But then when we're dealing with the person in front of us, we don't know whether that slight tone or intonation or misinterpreted word suddenly gets taken out of context or is not even in the same ballpark as the context that they are perceiving in their own head. I'm pretty sure, though, Ellen, that you've, you know, if you've reached a certain age, you've certainly had plenty of social contacts all through your life. So you have some good sense of what the other person may be thinking. The first thing, Ellen, is to have trust in yourself. Have confidence that what you're thinking in your mind has some value, and certainly that value should be heard and at least aired to others, and then they can make a judgment upon the words that you convey. Now, just say that you do get it wrong. Say if you've misinterpreted the situation. What is the worst that can happen? It's not a one-and-done situation. So when you can see that things are falling off the rails, that clearly the other person, and you, you can tell certainly with their body language, with maybe they're increasing their tone, they seem to be getting more upset, or maybe they're getting frosty and they're shutting you out. Those, those subtle cues tell you that, okay, maybe something was incorrect. So you can ask clarifying questions. These might go along something like this. So have I interpreted the situation correctly? And can we say that we can move forward on my suggestions? And at that point, your colleague, friend, family will say yes or no. If they say yes, that's great. Then you can move on to the next part of the conversation. If they say no, that's great. That's where you pick up and throw in an open question. Hmm, okay, what would you say is a more accurate description of the situation? So you start off with asking a yes or no question, and then, depending on their answer on that, you can open up to what's commonly known as the open questions, the what, where, how, when, and why, and that will then get them to expand more on their thinking. Now, the second part of your question is more dealing with mindset. So you talk about which would make you feel worse if you did misinterpret the situation. Well, realize you're never going to get it 100% correctly, and there will sometimes be misinterpretations when you're having a conversation with someone. Keep in mind the old adage, to err is human. So we're going to make mistakes, we're going to make errors, we're going to misinterpret and not always do the right thing. The thought is not to catastrophize or to allow that little monkey in your head to go to beat yourself up. It's to understand, okay, uh, I got that incorrect. How can we steer it back to uh, a course in which that's more positive, that is more truthful to what the situation is actually about? And when you talk about less likely to do again, you're again talking about a different issue. And this has more to do again with grit and tenacity. So that's another muscle, a mind muscle that needs to be worked on if that's a thought that it's, again, if you get something wrong, oh no, I'm never going to do that again. I mean, let's take that to its silly conclusion. Imagine when you were first riding a bike, the first time you fell over and grazed your knee, you went, that's it, done. I'm never going to get on that bike again. Okay, well then you'll never learn how to ride a bike. Or maybe you're learning a new skill. So learning how to drive a car. So if you're driving a geared car for the first time, you've got these three weird pedals below you, uh, accelerator, brake, and clutch, and you're thinking, what is this? How, do I, how am I ever going to get my head around working and coordinating these to get the car moving? And then you start bunny hopping because you've, you haven't found that biting point and you can't drive the car properly. Uh, I don't want to go too deep just in case there are people out there that don't drive cars. The, the situation stands. When you're learning how to drive a car, this is a, a, an assault on all your senses on trying to learn a new skill. Now, if you stopped at the first time you failed, then what you're doing is you're cutting off pathways in your life, cutting off pathways which you can learn and grow from. And that 
you have to be honest with yourself. If you're happy with that, then yes, you won't expand and you will always fear fearful and you'll always worry about retribution. But if you move through that soup, that first inertia, that first molasses of feeling like, oh, this feels horrible, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Once you get past that and you start repeating practice, practice makes perfect, practicing these same skills, you'll find it becomes easier over time and also you'll start learn, learning and growing faster. And you, you know that kind of growth curve that looks like a kind of hockey stick and then kind of plateaus off at a point and then again you get that kind of uh, hockey stick uh, shape again in, in your learning cycle. So keep at it. Just keep trying all these new things, and if you're never, if you've never been very good at being assertive, I get it. It's it's going to be tough. It's going to feel very uncomfortable, and you are going to sometimes get these things wrong. And to, so, to summarize, yeah, understand that you are going to get these things wrong, and so just ask questions, clarify, just see if that if your interpretation, that first interpretation, is correct, and then move on from that. Uh, they'll tell you if you're if you're if you've got it wrong, either through their words or through their body language or some other kind of smoke signal that you'll you'll definitely get to know. And then learn from it. It's not the end of the world, and it's something in which you can kind of chalk up and go, "Hmm, okay, I could have done that better," or "Wow, that went really well." And don't forget to pat yourself on the back when it does go well. We're always very good on grounding our face into the dirt when it doesn't go so well. Don't forget to pat yourself on the back and give yourself a high five internally or externally to whoever you want when you have done something really well. So, Ellen, I hope that's at least given you a first few steps into the right direction on what to do if you've never really been assertive. And, yeah, I hope that helped. Thanks. So the next question comes from Latika in Bengaluru, India. So thanks for your question, Latika. She says, I feel a constant battle of trying to be liked and the struggle of not wanting to be judged. This then lends me to catastrophize and imagine what they might think of me and telling others, help. So thank you for your question, Latika. It's slightly adjacent, I think, to the, to the topic, but I, I, I get the thought. Uh, when you're trying to be assertive, you're thinking that someone's going to judge you for, for being assertive. And then, obviously, you get in your own head, and your little monkey starts going crazy and starts thinking of all the consequences, i.e. they're going to fire you or they're going to think bad of you. A couple of things here. So one, just understand that everyone is judging everyone all the time. This thought that uh, don't judge others. Yeah, we're all judging others. A great dispeller of the myth that, look, that no one's judging anyone else is that book by Daniel Kahneman that I think I mentioned on another podcast, which is Thinking Fast and Slow, where he lays out Obviously, the thinking process of, of what we first do, that fast bit, and that fast bit is essentially heuristics and bias. These are the snapshots that we make of the world, the stereotypes that we overlay on everyone, because our mind just doesn't have the time to go to deep dive on every single bit of information that comes into it. So it makes a generalization. So understand this, Latika, that the minute you're speaking to anyone, whether they know you or not... They are already creating judgments in their mind. And let me take it one step further. I mean, and forgive me, this is my own heuristic that I'm going to make of your statement, is that that judgment sounds like you think that it's going to be a negative judgment, that they're, they're thinking badly of you or that potentially that uh, they're not going to look at you in a good light. You can also flip that around because you don't know what they're thinking and none of us know what anyone else is thinking as I've said previously, unless you ask them a question, just ask them directly. So the thought is, what is getting your mindset correct once you decide to approach your respective colleague or, or person that you want to be more assertive with and understand that 
they're actually, it's almost like tricking your mind. You walk in thinking they're going to think really well of you. By you espousing what you're about to espouse, they're going to think the world of you. So it, when you walk into that situation already, that so you dispel that self-limiting belief that already they're, they're already going to think badly of you. you. You basically take that power away from your little monkey mind. You take the power away from some of the internal anxiety that I'm, I'm, I'm sensing that you may have when you approach these situations. Because you will use a word that's obviously um, quite loaded, which is catastrophize. And to catastrophize is to think so badly on a situation that it is a catastrophe. You know, this is a volcanic eruption, an asteroid hitting the earth. And what I'd, I'd like to dispel is that when you get into a situation and you want to make a genuine push for something that you want or even a push back on, on something that's been imposed on you, when you are trying to be assertive, try to perceive or think or set your mindset that actually you are going to get what you want and it is going to be a positive outcome. And it really is amazing. And it always sounds like woo-woo, but it, it is really amazing how much that if you walk into a situation believing that there's going to be a positive outcome and they're going to think well of you, how much that actually leads to it being positive and you getting exactly what you want. Now, the other part of your question is imagining what they think of you and telling others. So I think the operative word there is imagine. That's exactly what's happening. A scenario has been created in your mind that they, one, are literally thinking so much more about this situation than you are, and that's never the case. And two, that they have time, energy, and the motivation to not only judge you, think about how, in inverted commas, badly you've done, and then go and tell others. This is not really a reality. This is that mystic Meg. This is the your own monkey mind running amok in your head. And that is where I direct you back to uh, dealing with that monkey mind. Because I think what's happening here is there's scenarios that are happening, Latika, that aren't just based in reality on this. And, you know, just understand, I'm, I'm, this isn't a, a criticism. This is just something that for all of us, we have to work on. And managing our monkey mind, managing our anxiety, and we all have have it to a certain level, uh, depending on the situation, is always a constant battle. But you, it does get easier. And this is where you have to use some of the practices that I, I set out in that in that first first pod to try and help you alleviate and give you some tools in your toolkit to go out and fight that crazy little monkey that wants to run amok. So try, try, go back to that pod, listen to a few of those and try that because that second part is less about assertiveness and more about letting your mind just run around a little bit too much. I hope that's helped, Latika. Yeah, ping me back and let me know if, if it has been helpful for you. Great stuff. Thank you. On to the next. Great. So the next question comes from Brad in Houston, Texas. So thanks for your question, Brad. And he asks, how can I manage my own anxiety and even panic just thinking of becoming assertive with another individual? So thank you very much for that question, Brad. And I really love that you're so open with regards to that emotional content uh, in, in, in your mind about feeling anxiety and panic. Too often, and I'm, I'm making a generalization here, too often men uh, think that, oh, no one else is anxious about the situation or we just need to buck up. We just need to show that we're men and we, we can take it. Well, that's just nonsense. It, it is nonsense. Uh, yes, there are, there are things in which that socially and culturally we can certainly say that men in general usually buck up, shut up and just get on with it. But it's not. It, it it doesn't help us. And on the other other uh, side, it doesn't always help to talk about everything, because then it doesn't give you you yourself agency to 
try and work out and formulate and reflect on your own problems before and trying something out first before then going, okay, maybe that's not going to work. Maybe I'll ask the collective wisdom of the group. So forgive me, that's a little bit of a side, but Brad, I love your question. Okay, how can you manage your own anxiety? Well, I haven't really done a pod on anxiety, and I get it that it, it, it is obviously linked with you being assertive with another individual. And this could be that there's some sort of power dynamic, or maybe it's an authority figure, or it, you know, it could even be your, your wife, girlfriend, parents, significant other, whatever. But obviously, it's someone significant enough that it almost drives you beyond just general anxiety in the situation you mentioned that it even goes to panic, which is like dialing it up to 11. Now, when situations like that happen, just understand what's happening internally. And again, very basic. Essentially, what's happening is as your anxiety goes up, obviously, the adrenaline goes into your system, which obviously makes your heart pump faster, that fight or flight. You also have another system that's also co-opting your brain, which is cortisol flowing into your prefrontal cortex, shutting that down. That's the inverted commas stress hormone. So essentially what you're dealing with then, so for those not familiar with the brain, the prefrontal cortex is that last bit of brain that separates us from a lot of the other animals. That's our executive functioning. That's the, that's the higher thinking part of the brain. So you can imagine if suddenly that is getting shut down, you're now working on older systems in the brain such as the limbic system, the amygdala, those kind of lizard-type parts of the brain. And that way you're not necessarily thinking straight. And that's where when you come out of an argument or a high, highly stressful, anxiety-producing, panicking situation, if anyone asks you to relate back to what was said, what was done, usually there's big gaps in your memory. And that's means that your system has gone too far. It's been dialed up too much for a threat that really isn't there. It's not like there's a tiger around, about to kind of rip your face off. It's a conversation that you may be having with another individual where you're thinking about being assertive, but your system has been co-opted so much, it's been skewed so far to a, a level that it's, it's, not, uh, it's not functioning properly and that's why you're feeling such panic. Okay, so to manage this, Brad, is a couple of things. And then I also will direct you back to my first pod on Taming That Monkey because it gives you some techniques. It's, again, there's breathing exercises. You've probably even seen on TV and movies, they have them sometimes counting to 10. Yes, it does work. It sounds silly, but just breaking that time to allow your system to calm down and not allow it to run away is, is, is part of it. And there's various different breathing techniques. So just Google breathing techniques and anxiety and you'll come up with hundreds and thousands of them. Mindfulness and meditation. Again, it's not, it may be not something that you're doing at the moment. Uh, or if you are doing it, fantastic. Keep it up. It's, it's one of those things that Practice makes perfect, and you'll never be perfect at it, so you'll have to keep practicing, but you will, it will certainly make it easier and easier. So in the moment, it's, it's either it's certainly breathing techniques, and to get yourself to a more calm mindset, it's mindfulness and meditation that will help with this. A couple of other things that I'll mention when we're talking about mindset, and this is what we, we really want you to go into a situation, is, as I mentioned previously, you're part of the reason why it's going from anxiety almost into panic is there's usually that thought of judgment and a feedback loop. So you're already predicting some sort of negative outcome. That's why it shoots up so high, uh, that, that anxiety of yours. So th the thought is, Walk into that situation really believing that you're going to win. You're going to cross the line first, just like an athlete at the Olympics. You have to see yourself winning the gold medal. If you don't see yourself winning the gold medal, 
you'll never win the gold medal. You have to visualize what you want of that situation and and hold that in your mind as a picture or as a video or go to your in inverted commas happy place and get your mind right before you start approaching that individual in which that you want to be assertive with and then that will also help you to manage the anxiety a little bit better at the situation but anxiety is a huge topic it's it's it certainly can't be answered in 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 the time I've allotted here but give those techniques uh, a try Brad and if you want some more help and and specifically ping me another email and um, just on more specifically your situation and I can I can see if I can tweak some things for your specific situation Hope that helps, Brad. And yeah, ping me over an email if you if you need some some more advice specifically on that anxiety. Great stuff. Thanks, and on to the next question. The next question is from Gareth in Bridgend in Wales. So Gareth asks, I struggle to be assertive with people higher up the food chain for fear of the consequences to my career and just getting along. Well, thanks, Gareth, for your question. So first thing to say is this is common. A lot of people certainly have deference for authority. Some of it's justified and some of it is, well, not deserved. They've just moved up the the chain because they've been there the longest. But I, I would direct you back to part three, that how it can affect your life on that on that podcast on assertiveness, where I basically say, it, study after study has shown a positive correlation between those that are assertive and career progression in the workplace. So inversely, those of a more agreeable and submissive persuasion have a negative correlation on moving up the ladder, being trusted with more responsibility regardless of how skilled they might be, to the point that even though aggressive personalities might lose their jobs more often, their careers progress further over the long haul. So that is the short straw. So Given that the data shows that if you are more submissive, if you don't push for what you want in a workplace, fine, Gareth, is you're actually going to get less of what you want or maybe what you deserve, actually, with regards to you know the great work that you may do for an organization. And so understand that when the higher ups in inverted commas are, are listening to your proposals or listening to your arguments and when you're when you need to be assertive or push back on some of their ideas, what they may be perceiving is a leader, someone who can who can uh, stand up for what they believe in, uh, competently, cohesively, and comprehensively outline an argument to why that process or new way of working should be implemented, and then standing by what you say. That's a leader. And so what you're displaying there is leadership qualities. If you're always going, and I'm not saying this is this of you, but if you're always in going and agreeing with whatever the higher-ups are mentioning, if you're always being submissive and saying yes, then what that tells the higher-ups, your leaders, your bosses, is that, well, this person is just going to go along and get along, and you don't stand out from the pack of being someone that could manage a team so they can't they remember if they are going to promote you or if you want to move up that career ladder they have to envision that they have to see it in their mind that you could take that position but if you're always agreeing with them and there's never a pushback and there's no uh, yeah that sounds good however i think we can do with this a different way it doesn't mean that they'll agree with you or even adopt your idea, but they can see that you've you've thought through a concept, you've presented it firmly, assertively, and then you allow feedback for that. You allow challenge and debate, and at the end, you may actually get what you want, and that is how the higher ups need to see you. So when you, when again next time you get to a point, Gareth, where you think, oh, maybe I'd don't want to push forward. Just realize that you're actually probably, it's self-harm. It's hurting your career by not showing 
that you can step forward and make these decisions. I hope that 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 helps. And I don't have any tips and tricks on this. This is something in which that the whole pod that I gave on the assertiveness, I think, can help. And so that's for you to to be more assertive because your ideas are valuable, Gareth, and, and you need to push that forward. So I don't think I have anything to add then. It's just understand the research shows and the data shows that if you take a step back, if you're always in the corner, if you're not going to push back to what you think is a bad idea from some of your leaders, then people go, well, no, I'm, I'm not going to step forward now. And what will happen is your leaders will look at you and say, hmm, when they're coming to promote internally or externally, they're going to pass over you. And that will be because they haven't seen anything from you to get them to envision that you could step up into that next level and manage a team or manage a department or manage an international team or manage a whole division of the company, et cetera, et cetera. I think you get what I mean. So hopefully that helps, Gareth. And again, as I've said to everyone, if there's something more specific or I've missed something on that question, ping me another email, give me a little bit more specific details, and I'll see if I can tweak it a little bit for for your situation. Great. Thanks, Gareth. Ah, someone from back home. So I've got a question from Maggie in Adelaide, South Australia. Uh, So she says that I am a person that is used to being passive aggressive, I'm told. And in general, is it a larger step to becoming assertive in the workplace or anywhere, really? Well, thank you very much for your question, Maggie. Well, as I kind of stated earlier in this pod, it is a bugbear of me, of people that are passive aggressive. But look, all of us have our foibles and everything can always be overcome, Maggie. There is nothing that really that you're stuck with. You can always adapt uh, if you have a will, if you have a growth mindset. And it sounds even just by asking this question that you do. Part of the reason, and I don't know your specific situation, but part of the reason is that maybe there is a certain power dynamic. Who are you being passive aggressive with is something that I would like to know. Is it someone, for instance, as a woman of greater physical strength? Is it someone that you're afraid that could turn uh, nasty or physical? So, so because you can't overtly be aggressive because that might trigger that person, is this why you hold yourself back? Or is it something that you've learnt and modelled through friends, family, parents, whoever that, that you may have met? So I think on this one, it's just about uh, understanding a little bit more about your situation. And the reason I included your question in here, uh, because I don't have a very concrete answer, because I think it's, it's broad enough that I'd need to know more about you, Maggie, before I could say whether, whether, uh, whether you could make that leap specifically, but you said in general, is it a larger step? No, not particularly, because essentially where you are, passive aggression is, it, it's on the aggressive scale. Uh, it's not on the assertive st- scale. It's not even on the submissive scale. It's on the aggressive scale. It's just a scale in which that you don't feel confident about being aggressive. And remember, we don't want you to be aggressive. We want you to move on to a different scale, which is, which is assertiveness. And so... Even that you're on a more forceful scale, shall we say, while you you may be less forthcoming in your aggression, it's still on the more uh, on the more actionable part. So we can we just need to shift that priority to understand that actually it's not aggression we want. We don't want to get something from. Where we don't want to make someone do something because I say so. What we want is to convince them that what you have is of value and it should be heard and this is how you present it and then welcome any challenges to that and then you can obviously counter arg there can be counter arguments, there can be renegotiations, etc. So you're not it isn't a larger step. That's that's the that's the short answer. And the way to direct 
you back to from passive aggressive to being more assertive would be something in which that it does need someone to understand or even for you to to gain an understanding of what that what the root of your passive aggressive actions and behaviors stem from where they stem from and then we can start looking about correcting or shifting you back to a more positive part of being assertive which you, what you'll find again is you'll actually find you get more positive results and that will be a positive feedback loop once you start to see that it works rather than building resentment resentment with with friends family people or colleagues because of your passive aggressiveness you'll start to go well for everything it's it's positive feedback so you'll start doing it more often it's a, this is a very roundabout answer for this maggie and so forgive me that there wasn't anything very specific i included it in this because I mean, at the time, before the formal question, I hadn't thought about actually doing a, a full podcast. But I, again, I think you might be one that will do well listening to the podcast that I put out on passive aggressiveness, some of the some of the historical where, where it stems from and also where it can go and what you can do to, to change such such um, a mentality and behavior. Right. Thanks, Maggie, for your question. And look out for my next pod on passive aggressive. Thanks. Right, so the last question comes from Sophie in Manhattan, New York. So Sophie asks, as a woman, compared to men, if you are assertive, you are labeled bossy or look at you wearing the pants. How can you counteract such stereotypes of being seen where men are perceived as leaders or go-getters versus women being the B-word or difficult, in inverted commas. So great question, Sophie, and well, kind of very relevant uh, with more and more women entering the workforce and potentially some men not understanding that actually the same standards that they are held to are not the ones that that you yourself are heard to, and I've heard this quite a bit from from various women and clients talking about how there is that such disparity. So how do we counteract the stereotype? So the short answer, Sophie, is as a cultural and phenomenon, it's going to be a slower process. That doesn't mean it's going to be glacial. That doesn't mean it's not going to happen in our lifetime. We all hope that. It just means that as a group, to ask all the the men over a certain age to suddenly change their thinking. Remember, their thinking has come from various sources. It's come from modeling their parents, and their parents have been modeled on their grandparents. So if we don't need to go too many generations back before we find that the idea of, of a woman's position and where she was in the world is is quite a bit different to where they are now, in which that you're getting better grades at, at high school, you're getting better grades at university. Uh, there's at least 50% of women in the workforce as of today, and that will only grow. And certainly, well, there needs to be a huge amount of of change in the boardroom that will eventually change as more and more competent and amazing women get up to actually take those seats. So there's there's as as a as an overall arching group and culturally I think that will be a slower change. But what can you do? And what you can do is do what we we spoke about in in the podcast on how to be more assertive. You can still use all those techniques, all those changes, and what that what that will show the men folk in your organization if you're having some issues with them uh, seeing you slightly different is remembering that you're what you're doing is you're setting out down boundaries, you're giving red lines, you are saying this is my value, this is what I think, and then confidently and assertively putting that forward, and then. Allowing argument, allowing discussion. Remember, men love a bit of competition. So if they can push back and then you can you can fight them on the battlefields of words, 
what you will find is you will gain some respect from the colleagues that are amenable to change. And for some colleagues, that may not be possible. And we all know this, and it's 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 just a, a part of life. Some people will just not change, or certainly not change quick enough. But those who are amenable to change will see and treat you differently, because they will see, again, leadership qualities, things that will push you forward. A perception... Strange enough, from from my mother who worked in finance, she worked in banking way back when, when women weren't meant to be working in banking, they were meant to be secretaries and uh, and the like, is that there was a a culture early on in which that maybe, and again, this is anecdotal, so this is not data that I'm quoting, it seemed like women would come in and become more aggressive and that would be a way of differentiating themselves from the other women of the group to try and move forward. It's just because you didn't have a whole, you know, hundreds of years of culture of being in the workplace. So it was it was almost the pendulum swung too far to the right. You were too some women were too aggressive, and this is again, I I, I stress this as a perception of one. There are some studies to that, that talk about this, but I, I I'm not quoting anything that I right now uh, uh, from from data sets. And the thought is, so then they got their their you know inverted commas b words thrown around at them. That's who they were. That I think has changed, and I think the 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 women today that are, I mean, let's say under fifty. What we're looking at is from you know Gen X to Millennials and onwards. What we're seeing is they are very well educated. They're the best educated women that's ever been in society. They're making a fantastic impact. They're coming up with different ideas, different approaches that men might do. And that's not to say that they're better and worse. But what we find usually is those mixed groups of men and women usually do better than all men or all women. And that is that is borne out by the data. So as we get closer and closer to a more cohesive idea of everyone being in the workplace has has a chance to push forward and it doesn't just become a boys club. You being assertive will obviously help you individually and you will see that you will get that positive feedback of finding that that will increase your career. But you'll also have the secondary benefit of doing a couple of things. One, it's that the younger women that are coming up behind you will see you and that they'll be able to model your behavior within the workplace and understand that that's that's a way to get ahead. So that is fantastic. People always need to see role models in their own image. And secondly... It can also be something that you can do yourself, and that's to go out and mentor younger women. Uh, and forgive me, I'm, I'm saying younger women. I don't even know how old you are, Sophie. But a, a, as you move up the chain, you get to help women further down the, the, the career ladder. And if you help mentor them, that also will help basically bring them up. And there'll be whole generations of women that can help each other and work together so that there is a better, more functioning workplace, which will ultimately make the the business more profitable. So uh, this is an anthropological question in which that I'm not even sure I'm qualified to answer, if I'm I'm truly honest, Sophie. So I'll, I'll put up my hand. But I think that being assertive, holding your ground, and if you do it assertively, remember that is also thinking that you're going to convince someone else of the value of your ideas rather than to either bash them over the head or be over aggressive or overly submissive that's the way of changing the workplace and it it's you know it's it almost sounds cheesy but it it will happen one woman at a time and that as the sisterhood moves into the workplace and men get used to that I know, I know, they've had plenty of time to get used to it, but we're slow sometimes. It, it, will, it will certainly bear fruit for, for, for you and, and, and the rest of your sisterhood on that. 
couple that with with younger women seeing you work and also with you helping and mentoring the next generation that is coming up behind you that will be well something that we all look forward to and i will definitely see results on the bottom line so that's that's what i have to say on it sophie it's more of a philosophical question and i hope i did it some justice thanks sophie Well, a big thank you to all. Thank you so much for all your questions. I really appreciate all of them. I read them all. I hopefully have captured a flavor and a grouping of all of the questions that you've sent me. But in case I haven't, I might still do another follow-up further down the line. But all it leaves me now to do is to thank you for your time, your attention. I look forward to your opinions. So I pine away. This has been my opinion. What's yours? Thanks for listening, and I'll see you on the next episode. On the next episode of the Opine Motel podcast. So folks, it's my first interview, and it's with a fantastic special guest, Brad Hart, entrepreneur, founder of Make More Marbles and Mastermind Groups, where we delve into the mind of an entrepreneur. Check out his fantastic book, The 8-Minute Mastermind, which I've just finished. It was very insightful in how, from a challenging upbringing, he's risen to be a top Tony Robbins affiliate, conversing with Richard Branson and hanging out with Tim Ferriss. He's been learning, growing, and creating great ways for business leaders to collaborate, share, and grow their own businesses through the power of his mastermind groups, which he leads. And now with the Make More Marbles uh, company, is helping more and more people start their own mastermind groups, and beginning to share their own collective wisdom. Can't wait for you guys to hear this one. Good listeners. In a announcement of self-indulgence, please, if you've found anything of value, please subscribe to my podcast on your favorite podcast listening service. You can also visit my website, www.opine.network. Oh, 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 and also check me out on YouTube and write a review if the need should take you. If anything has affected you in a more serious way, I highly recommend my psychological professionals in your area to explore and delve into making you live your best life. Be well. See you next time. I look forward to your company then. Thank you very much for listening. I'm LJ, your host. This has been the Opine Motel podcast. Music credits go out to the intro. Fluffy by Smith and Mister. Interlude Sounds by Sephiros and the CS House Happy Life by Prayer. Be well, everyone. See you soon.